to tell you a couple minutes about Dan's test equipment and also uh, kind of what we do here. So we've been in business since 1981 and we specialize in unique test equipment. So a lot of it is uh, EMC equipment, power equipment, environmental test equipment. We'll have a track going on in the other building with our electrical test equipment throughout the day. And so if you have any questions, uh, you could uh, find people wearing uh, shirts like mine or ties and we'd love to give you a tour. This presentation, we're going to try to cap it off at 9.50 to give you guys a 10 minute break in case you want to go to the exhibit hall or go to their track. Um, also want to mention uh, the IEEE EMC show, since so a lot of uh, the vendors, we volunteer for the IEEE EMC Society. So I'd love to uh, brochure everyone's desk with the IEEE information if anyone is interested to go into the symposium next. I think it's July in New Orleans, since uh, the call for papers is up. And uh, with that, I want to get this started and introduce our first speaker. So uh, Chuck Britton's coming all the way from the East Coast, and uh, he's going to be talking about the importance of EMC testing using in-house and or versus outside test labs, and an overview standard and what equipment is needed. So a little background about Chuck. He's a regional sales manager for Amplifier Research, or AR, and prior to that, he attended CSU Northridge and has been in the industry for over 10 years. So with that, let's all welcome Chuck. Actually, it's closer to 30 by now, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Real, real set, he, you took it off your LinkedIn, so you got to okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. 20 years. Yeah, I've been involved in EMC for a while there, so. How many of you are involved directly in EMC testing? Good. Oh, a couple? Okay. So uh, this is basically going to be a 5,000 foot overview of what EMC testing is, a little bit of the terminology, a little bit about what goes into it. It's a lot to cover in 45 minutes, so hopefully we'll have a little time for a Q&A at the end. If there's something you absolutely don't understand, uh, uh, stop, raise your hand, we'll see what we can do. So. In the beginning, there were some guys that uh, figured out that you could transmit stuff wirelessly. Radio frequency, RF. Shortly after that, there came RF interference, which means that two people were trying to do the same thing on the same frequency, and got, they got in trouble. And these days, we got it everywhere. RF is everywhere. Uh, and the purpose of EMC compliance testing is to uh, help stuff work properly. So there's a lot of places that are RF sources, and I'm using RF uh, in a very general term. I also mean microwave, typically anything above a gigahertz, microwave, but RF is a generic term. Anything that's in the RF spectrum that uh, um, is, is included in, uh, in the talk here. But there's a lot of stuff out there, and like I said, getting uh, more and more all the time. Yeah, a lot of stuff is wireless. And these are just intentional radiators. These are things that are supposed to radiate at a given frequency. Every piece of electronics has the potential to be an unintentional radiator, meaning that if it's got a microprocessor in it or a motor that's got a clock in it, it can actually radiate that clock frequency unintentionally. So let's get to understand a couple of the basic terms, because I found that learning any subject is starting to understand the jargon. So, uh, EMC, EMI, they kind of get used interchangeably. Usually in the industry, EMC stands for electromagnetic compatibility. That means a piece of gear will work when it's bombarded with RF. And EMI, electromagnetic interference, means that a piece of gear is going to radiate out into the world and create problems. But they're used interchangeably. And um, a good way to uh, keep it all in focus is that all of this is designed to make sure that products work as intended without interfering with other products and without being interfered by other products. So everybody plays nice in the sandbox together is a little quote we, we like to say. Why do we test for EMC? Well, because it's required by law in a lot of places. You can't sell product to Europe unless it passes the EC uh, standards. You can't sell electronic products in the U.S. unless it passes FCC standards. Worldwide, almost every country has some sort of standard that plays off of the EC standard. Secondly, 
you want to make sure your customers are satisfied with your product. Some of you might be old enough to remember, you know, we were watching cartoons as kids and our moms would vacuum the floor on a Saturday morning and the TV would get all fuzzy. Mom! <laughs> you know what? I'm ruining my favorite show! Well, that doesn't happen anymore, or very seldom, because vacuum cleaners are designed better and televisions are designed better. So that's just an example of a type of electromagnetic interference that um, has gotten better. You know, when there's a complaint about a cell phone that uh, getting too much noise, you know, uh, th those are very complex instruments. There's a lot of design and thought goes into that to make sure, and testing that goes into that to make sure that they'll work as intended. And of course, the real reason we do this is we don't want anyone to sue on our product. As uh, you can keep the lawyers out of it, you know, you don't want anybody proving that as I was driving my car by the airport and the radar hit it, my electronic brakes locked up. You know, big liability. So, so that's why we test for these kind of things. So the easy way, there, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself here. <clears throat> Categorize EMC, EMI into five basic categories. Conducted emissions, radiated emissions, conducted susceptibility, and radiated susceptibility. Susceptibility and immunity are interchangeable words. Uh, certain industries, like the military, tend to use susceptibility more. The commercial world tends to use immunity a little more. And then there's a group of related tests that usually get thrown in with an EMC lab, such as ESD, burst and surge, flicker, harmonics. Those are usually done by specialized pieces of test equipment. Most of this talk is going to focus on the top four. So the easy way to remember it is emissions is what's coming off the product, what's being emitted from the product, either through the air or via wires. That's through the air is radiated, through the wires is conducted. And conversely, immunity is uh, also is what's coming into the product. You want it to be immune to either stuff coming through the air or stuff coming through wires. Now when do you start testing for EMC? Well, the sooner in your product development cycle, the better. Because you don't want to have 10,000 pieces on the shelf ready to go to market and all of a sudden it doesn't pass and you've got to start fixing it before you can sell it. So breadboarding is probably a little early and it depends a lot on your history with EMC testing. If you have a lot of problems with it, you want to get the earlier you get testing in it. But certainly by the time you're doing board turns and start to get into pre-production, it's good to get a product in and make sure that initially it looks like things are going to be good. Because there's a lot of things that can go wrong in designing a product these days. Now, uh, the way that you design for better EMC is primarily through the circuit board. Like I said, I'm going through this real fast. As a real uh, 5,000 foot level. There are week-long courses that are taught on how to design circuit boards to pass EMC. There's programs out there that help you design circuit boards for EMC. The length of your trace versus your clock speed can create an antenna. So those are the things you've got to be careful of. Your, your vias, how your grounding patterns are laid out. Those are all things that have to be taken into consideration when you're designing for EMC slash EMI. And even sometimes a, a good PC board isn't enough. You need to do what I call band-aids, which are shielding and filters. Now, most of us are familiar with the uh, ferrite beads. I love your right. uh, The ferrite beads, you see these on your cables. Did you know that that's what they're for? It's to suppress EMI, both going in and going out of the cable. Um, whoops. A lot of other things that you see, power line filters are very common on instruments. And then gasketing and um, cans and that type of thing. Have you ever had a chance to take apart or you're involved in like, something like a cell phone? It's been a long time since I took apart a cell phone. But you'll see that everything is compartmentalized in it. And there's cans or gasketing and metal boxes, basically. Uh, sometimes they metalize the plastic here to contain the RF that's in that little thing or to keep, to keep it from, and also to protect the device from getting bombarded by stuff that could be coming in. So that's all in the grounding. And then some bigger gear, you might need gaskets. Uh, if you've ever been to an EMC chamber, you notice that the, uh, the doors have this stuff called 
finger stock along the edges. That's so when you close the door, it's a tight RS seal. You can do that with uh, different types of cabinets depending upon the, uh, the uh, environment it's going to be in. So you decided that uh, EMC is an issue. There's a couple of different ways and places to test it. Um, first of all, there is uh, third-party houses like the NTSs, the Intertechs, the uh, TUVs of the world, or your company might justify doing it in-house. We'll cover a little bit of the uh, whys to go either way on that. But understand that there's um, basically two levels of testing. Compliance testing is what you're doing to get the final sign off so you can go to market. EMC, EMI is largely a self-regulated industry. You go out to an outside lab or if you've got a certified lab in-house, in you sign it off, you state that you, uh, you've met all the requirements of the CE mark, FCC mark, and you go to market. You don't have to submit it you don't have to submit a product to a government agency for them to test. But if somebody from that government agency comes and pulls your product off the shelf, say you're selling office products and they go into Staples, pull it off the shelf, and they test it and it doesn't pass, they're going to shut you down or they're going to pull that product off the market immediately. So it's very important that we pass these kind of tests. So you, you want to get that final sign off. But a lot of uh, what goes into getting that final sign-off is called pre-compliance. So anything short of that final sign-off is pre-compliance. We talk about when you start the testing. So if you're at the prototyping stage, you're doing pre-compliance testing. Let's stick it in the lab, let's put it in front of a spectrum analyzer or a receiver, see, see how quiet it is or not quiet, see if you've got any problems, okay, we're good to go. You might also do the same thing with uh, uh, the, the radiated immunity side of things. So you're talking to management, some VP comes in and says, we're spending 200 grand a year at the compliance houses. What's going on? Can't we do this in-house? Well, yeah, 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 you can, yeah. And there's also other advantages to having an in-house lab. You don't have to always run down the street or run across town or run across the country to a compliance house every time you want to test. If it's right down the hall, that's great. And, and it's easier to get into and develop uh, and, and test during uh, your different stages of development. Like I say, easier to schedule quite often. Usually if it's in-house, very little travel costs. You know, that's part of what you have to deal with when you're going uh, to an outside lab. You know, if you're in a big metro area like this, you're, you're pretty fortunate that you've got a lot of labs to choose from that are just to drive across town or less. which all, all of this helps you get to market faster. So, it's a, that's so not only are you spending X dollars in an outside lab, what are the non-hard costs of not having an in-house lab? And those are the, uh, the travel costs, the market, getting to market, the, the rework and design that, that you can't see. But there's reasons not to have an in-house lab. And the primary, issues are to do a full, not even a full compliance lab, but even a good pre-compliance lab it can be anywhere from a quarter million to a million dollars. So that's a, that's a big, your management's going to be looking at a big ROI. Show me the numbers, show me where we can save that kind of money over three to five years or whatever they consider a capital equipment ROI to be to justify getting into this. Um, you have to have trained personnel. You know, something you can't just let this thing sit there you know, 30 out of 40 hours of a week, and some guy goes, yeah, I think I remember how to run that test. <laughs> so, um, and, yeah, and as I say, if it's not going to get efficiently used, that's what's going to be looked at. So what are the third-party lab advantages? Well, all the things that uh, you would need to make a good in-house lab. They've got accredited and trained personnel. They're constantly staying up on the standards. They have all the equipment. Some of this stuff is damn expensive. I know it myself. So, uh, and, and that's just the equipment. Um, like I say, a good chamber is going to be anywhere from 150 
thousand to a, a ten meter chamber it can be a million dollars if you count the parent building or more even. They run these tests all day long. This is their bread and butter. This is what they do. So they've got, they've got the, uh, uh, they've got the system down, and they know what it takes to be certified. They know the standards. They keep up on all the changes that are coming down, and they know how to interpret them. Some of these standards can be uh, open to interpretation, to say the least. And sometimes, even if you've got an accredited lab. You may want to go occasionally to an outside house just to make sure you've got a reality check that you, what you're doing in-house is compliant with what an industry standard good lab understands it to be. Now the third party disadvantages are the reasons that drive you to bring something in-house. The cost. These guys charge a couple thousand dollars a day. A few guys have ever scheduled EMC time. Um, you know that that can add up quickly, especially if you got problems. Oh my gosh, some labs are better at helping you troubleshoot your problems than others. So um, you know some of them will say, "Hey, it doesn't pass this frequency. Go home and come back when uh, you think you got it ready, and we'll schedule you three weeks out from when you call us, and we can get you in here again." And costs aren't just the cost of the lab. Remember, I mentioned your not so hard costs, your travel costs, your running late to market, all those kinds of things. And depending on how the economy is going, depending on how development cycles are going, I know a lot of labs around the country right now are running a two to three week lead time from the time you call them and say, I need to get my product in. Oh, what do you mean that's going to make me miss my uh, I'm, I'm selling consumer products? It's going to make me miss the holiday window. Oh, that's a real big deal if you're going to be late for shipping a product or you've got a customer, say you're a military house, and you've got a customer that's demanding that you deliver on a certain date, which is written into your contract. You might have uh, late penalty clauses and stuff like that. You've got, always got to consider when the labs can get you in. All right. So do you build or contract services? Well, you got to start looking. Management's going to want to know your ROI. How much do you spend at the labs? And consider all costs, your travel costs. You're going out to dinner costs when your engineers are down there, if, if you got to go out of town. Um, uh, those kind of things. A shipping product, if you got big product. You know, it's not cheap to ship around sometimes. How much is EMC a problem? If you, you've got a good design team or if you haven't had a lot of issues historically, you might not have to worry about it. Okay, we're, we're pretty good at this. Maybe, you know, we set a spectrum analyzer up in the back uh, room and check our emissions. If it looks pretty quiet, we send it to the lab. So if, you, if, if it's not a big problem overall, you have a hard time justifying bringing, bringing testing in-house. But does it affect your time to market? You always come back to, depending on the industry you're in, what, uh, what the, how's it going to affect you're getting the product where it needs to be. Now, the question is if the VP says, what, a million dollars to get a compliant lab in this place, can we start small? The answer is yes. And a lot of people start with some subset of the overall testing. Go ahead, see. A lot of people start with that fifth category that I mentioned, ESD testing, transients. The, event, the advantage of this is you typically don't need a chamber to test these test center. A good grounded plane and table, ESD, you can get started for about $10,000 with a good gun, I think, right? Yeah. So, it's been a while since I've sold those, so I'll, but you sell them all the time. Yeah, we have plenty of guys that <laughs> sell so, ESD guns. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there are some good boxes out there that do uh, the what's called the first and surge testing and the flicker and harmonics which is required in a lot of testing so again what areas do you have problems with it makes sense to start with going there as, as what you might want to bring in house um, okay, let's see. Radiated and conducted emissions is uh, um, often the next set to go to. Uh, it, it, it's funny in the U.S. Immunity 
testing is not required to put product on the market. The FCC only requires emissions testing. But if you're a worldwide company or you've got a customer, and this is for commercial products, by the way. Automotive requires uh, immunity testing, defense requires immunity testing, aerospace requires immunity testing. But for the most part, um, a PC or a phone does not require um, immunity, as much immunity testing to be legally on the market. So to get into involved in uh, conducted emissions, you have what's called an OATS, which stands for Open Area Test Site, or a semi-anechoic chamber, and we'll show a couple of examples of those. You also need what's called a EMI receiver, which is basically a very specialized spectrum analyzer, and some that's, these days you see a lot of uh, high-end spectrum analyzer with some receiver functionality in them. And then you need the associated equipment that goes with them so that you can measure either what's coming off the wires or what's coming through the air. So antennas or what they call um, uh, clamps. Now to do the uh, immunity side of things, typically in the commercial world you start with conducted immunity because again that doesn't require a chamber. A chamber is a big investment, not only in the actual construction, but your facility has got to be involved. You might need a parent building built for this, and it all depends on what size chamber you want to get into. But for conducted immunity in the commercial world, you typically only need a grounded workstation, a fairly small amplifier, SIG gen, power meters, clamps. Uh, a couple of companies also build these in dedicated test sets for uh, fairly good prices. And then when it comes to radiate immunity, that's where it can get very expensive fairly quickly. Because you do need a chamber for that, because you have to not only keep your product immune from all the forces in the outside world, the television stations and the radio towers and the cell towers, but you also, when you're radiating, testing that product and bombarding it with RF, you can't let that RF get out and start contaminating everything from the people to the equipment around them. So you need a chamber, you're going to need amplifiers, depending on what level you're testing to, it's going to determine the size of the amplifiers. SIG gen, uh, power meters, field monitors, there's a whole set of equipment that is used to uh, automate this testing and uh, hopefully make it uh, fairly quick. Because if you couldn't automate it, it would take you forever. All right, here's what an open area test site looks like. A nice rounded plane out there. Uh, this is an antenna. Underneath this dome is where the product sits, and it's typically 10 meters from the uh, antenna to the front of the EUT. And this is the ideal situation for testing. But there's several issues with open area test sites. First of all, it's getting harder and harder to find a place. It doesn't have some outside RF coming in. When was the last time you were in an area that didn't have cell phone coverage? You know, airplanes are flying over. They could be uh, contaminating your environment from an RF standpoint. And also, uh, this looks like a beautiful day out in the middle of nowhere. You've got environmental concerns because I bet it didn't like this year around. Oh, I got to get my product tested in December in Massachusetts. <laughs> you guys don't have to worry about winter here. <laughs> I've lived in California long enough, but most, most of the area doesn't have to worry about money. So the next thing you would do instead of an open area test site is you would use a chamber. Now this is an example of a fairly small anechoic chamber that would be used for pre-compliance testing. The absorber, that, this is called absorber that you see here, and it's typically um, uh, loaded a foam or styrofoam uh, loaded with a carbon compound that absorbs the RF. It helps you have a very controlled environment. So if you've got an antenna that's blasting, you want it hitting the front of your product, but you don't want it bouncing off the walls of this chamber, because the chamber is essentially a metal box. And the RF helps control, or the absorber helps control the RF to make sure that um, only what's coming directly from that antenna is bombarding your product. Because if you do have a failure, you want to say, okay, you can test your product on all six sides. You want to know what side it failed on, because that's going to help you locate the problem, whether it's a leak in your enclosure, 
whether it's exposing a, a trace on a circuit board or something like that. The gold standard for chambers, though, is the 10 meter chamber. And these are the ones that I'm talking about that cost a million dollars plus. Um, and what 10 meters means, again, is it's 10 meters from the antenna to the front of your EUT. And uh, these are pretty good sized rooms because not only does that have to be 10 meters, it has to be, uh, you have to have certain distances from your antennas to your, your walls and your absorber. And, um, uh, and then you have to have room to get your equipment in and out. And if you can imagine this chamber just being used for small commercial products, that's one size. But if you have a 10 meter chamber for a car, it has to be a heck of a lot bigger. And there are 10 meter chambers for cars with turntables, built in dynos, because uh, automotive has high, very high liability issues, so they have to test all different kinds of environments. Uh, and uh, like I say, these are very expensive. It's kind of interesting. If you walk in here and you see these white caps, you'll see white caps on most of your chambers. The only reason they're in there is because most of this absorber is dark and this lightens up the room. That's their only purpose, is to give you some, some daylight or, or some uh, good light reflection. All right, let's talk about the basic equipment we need for um, doing the various tests. Again, we'll start with radiated immunity. Uh, you're going to need a receiver, an anechoic chamber, and you also hear the term semi anechoic chamber. Oops. An anechoic, a fully anechoic chamber would be considered a chamber that has absorber on all six sides. A semi anechoic chamber, which most of the world uses, usually does not have absorber on the floor or very limited absorber on the floor. You can sometimes move absorber into your chamber to um, control. Uh, RF that might be bouncing off your uh, transmit antennas when you're testing something. So that's the difference between a semi and a fully anechoic chamber. So there's, the, there's what basically you need for doing radiated immunity. Uh, receivers, uh, like I say, are uh, specialty boxes uh, that are basically spec, spec hands on steroids, as I like to say, but they're programmed to do these tests uh, to the various standards. We'll cover standards uh, uh, in an overview in a little bit. To do the conducted immunity, remember conducted is on wires. You either put a current clamp around the wire or you uh, use what's called a listen line impedance stabilization network to um, put your wires through there and then, the, then you connect the, <coughs> your uh, spectrum analyzer, your, your receiver to this guy and it can read what's coming off. These are specialty boxes that are made by a couple of companies, probably rented by ATEC. So the, to do, to get you set up. Now to do conductive immunity, remember that's where we're going to put a signal onto wires. Uh, this is an example of a commercial standard, which is known as IEC 61000-4-6. Uh, there's a whole setup procedure that's in the standards that says you got to have a table that's this big, that's this far off the ground. The, your EUT has to be, I think it's 100 millimeters off the uh, Plane, and you you put your uh, we're going to put some clamps around the wires, and we're going to inject a cable, we're going to inject a signal in there, and then we're going to see if the EUT reacts. If the EUT doesn't react adversely, then it's going to be a passing situation. So the, the, again, the, it's a simple it's a simple situation where you have a uh, amplifier, a SIGGIN, usually some way to read the uh, signals that you're uh, transmitting. You usually want automation software because the, if you step through all these frequencies again, it'll take you forever. There are several software packages that are out there, including the stuff that we make. Uh, just in a slightly different example, showing DO160, which is the aerospace standard, uh, they require that you test in a chamber with a. Uh, this is a, a showing a table that's with grounding straps <coughs> to the chamber. All these standards have a lot of detail that goes into it. Again, that's why you got personnel that are trained to know these things. And you can't expect every design engineer that has to deal with some of this stuff to, to know every uh, little little thing that goes into these. Irradiated immunity, again, that's where we start getting into the, um, uh, the more expensive equipment, the bigger chambers, um, and 
uh, requirements for equipment. Again, you're going to need a signal source, uh, typically a signal generator, um, amplifiers that cover the frequency that's required, uh, and uh, automated test equipment and probes. There's basically two ways to do immunity, and it's called out by your standard, what's called the closed loop method, where you have a probe here. This is a probe that monitors how much you're radiating, and it's kept in the chamber while you're testing. So you're monitoring the actual fields you're developing. The substitution method is where you put the probe in without your EUT, and you, you run the levels, you figure out which level at each frequency is going to be needed, then you pull a probe out, substitute your uh, EUT, use that file that you've just built, and run the test. Kind of a block diagram of how a chamber looks with your EUT sitting here, your antenna is going to be radiating at it. Depending on what the standard calls for, the tip of the antenna to the EUT is going to be one to three meters away. This is an example of an uh, absorber on the floor, so it's, you're not getting bounced from the antenna off the ground or floor. And sometimes there's a control room, you don't need a room, a specific room outside to keep your equipment in, but a lot of people like that. Uh, so that's just an example of how, how you set up something. And here's a little bit more of a block diagram again. Table where you put your gear, three meters from the uh, uh, front of the EUT, and all the equipment that's needed. And all of this is connected typically through some type of interface, a GPIB bus. Uh, a lot of it's going to uh, Ethernet USB these days, which is a lot faster. And so you've got a computer that's talking to all these things and making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to. Another example, kind of showing the uh, side view of the absorber around the chamber, three meters you're hitting the uh, EUT with uh, radi radiation to see how it's going to operate. All right, I got about 10 minutes left here for a quick overview on standards. And um, that's what you test to. You test to a standard, and that depends upon your product and who your end customer is. Um, why are, why are there standards? Well, for uh, immunity, you want to make sure that products are protected from their environment. For emissions, you want to make sure that the product is not unintentionally radiating into the environment. You know, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, products have uh, intentional radiators. You know, if you've got to transmit to something, you've got to, you got to have an intentional radiator. But, you know, the examples I like to use uh, when people ask me, what does your equipment do? Well, and make sure that if somebody in a pacemaker walks by a microwave oven, a pacemaker isn't going to go into overdrive, you know? So this is important to test. That, that we make sure that, you know, if you're in a, in a hospital, you see a lot of signs that say, turn off your cell phone. Who the heck does that? Okay. But you want to make sure if you set your cell phone down on some, in, uh, some infusion pump, you know, that's hooked to your loved one, that it doesn't stop that or, you know, over, over, overdose them. So there, there, there's a lot of testing that goes on because they realize that people aren't going to follow instructions. Does everybody turn off their phone on an airplane or put it in, in the uh, in airplane mode? No. I mean, I carry three devices and I sometimes forget what to get all mine off. And I know that it's semi important. It can't be that important because they could, there are meters out there that could walk down the aisle and tell who's got a cell phone. But if you get most of them on, you're doing a good job. Also, in case you didn't know, your cell phone is working the hardest and draining the battery the fastest the farther it is away from an antenna from a, from a cell tower. So just keep in mind when you're on that airplane, you're draining your battery faster if you don't put it in the airplane. Just a little aside. Anyway, so standards. Standards help create reproducible results. They make sure everybody is on the same page. Um, they are supposed to test to some semblance of reality or at least over test to some semblance of reality. Typically, most of the standards are at much higher levels that you're going to see in the real world. But people want to make sure, again, they want to avoid lawsuits. They want to make sure your product's going to work. So, and it also makes sure that, like I say, everybody's playing on the same page. You know? The uh, Acer computer and the uh, 
HP computer tested to the same computer standards, so everybody knows what's going on out there. Okay, there are basically four categories of standards. Mill standard, automotive standard, aerospace, and commercial, which I've categorized telecom and medical as kind of subsets of the commercial standards. Um, and commercial also means consumer standards. So anything that isn't aerospace, automotive, and military falls under the commercial standards. And commercial standards are the lowest of all in the, um, uh, especially in the immunity uh, uh, range. Because again, the liability for military, automotive, and aerospace is so much higher. You know, somebody building an aerospace subsystem um, the, when you generate a field, when you bombard a field, when you bombard a product with a field, it's measured in what's called volts per meter. And just to give you an idea, a commercial product such as a cell phone is only tested to typically 3 volts per meter. A car is tested to 200 volts per meter, a couple of other times higher than that. And some military, they um, require um, radar tests that are in the thousands of volts per meter. EMP tested at 50,000. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> on the cell phone. So let's look at, uh, you'll see some of these numbers come up. Um, but again, this all depends on the kind of products that you guys are working with. If you're doing commercial products, you're going to be testing to the IEC standards typically. IEC 61000-4-3 and 4-6 are the guides for um, uh, the immunity side of things. And there's several CISPR standards for depending upon what category you fall into. Uh, a, an office product gets tested to something different, to a different standard than a home product. Um, a mill standard, the most common one out there in our world is uh, mill standard 461, which defines just about everything on the immunity and the emission side. Uh, DO160 is the standard uh, um, avionics uh, test. And Boeing and Airbus will have their own variations on a theme, but most of them refer to these documents for levels and test methodology and all of that. Uh, in the automotive world, uh, the ISO 11451 and 452 are the guiding standards. 451 is complete vehicle, 452 is uh, components. And almost all the auto manufacturers have their variations on a theme. Ford is notorious for saying, okay, that's great, but I want you to do this too. Um, just there, keep in mind if you're going to be building uh, automotive stuff. I'm working with a couple of the uh, new electric car makers out there, and they're all going to uh, this 451 standard for their how they're going to test it. Okay, why do we need to do all this testing? Well, I think we've covered that pretty well. Because you get these things to go, what? We've got to recall stuff to the EMI. I mentioned that um, uh, instance of driving by a airport and getting uh, hit. Uh, and I don't think it was uh, electronic braking, but it uh, was a sudden acceleration product. And you guys might have remembered that in a Prius, so it must have been 10 or 12 years ago. Prior to that, the automotive guys weren't testing the radar standards. We didn't have a radar call standard. Soon after this happened, they implemented that. So again, when stuff is discovered in the real world, test standards evolve to try to replicate what's going on out there. All right. How do I do Plenty of time. All right. Uh, questions, questions, comments? Okay, sir. Uh, can we get a copy of these slides? How do you test for, uh, I'm curious which standard might cover, like a medical device where you might test it in your uh, own facility or whatever, but until you actually get it out to that hospital, you're not going to know what other uh, traffic's going on and well that's that why they implement the standard so uh, the standard uh, typically a radiated immunity standard will run from 80 meg for a commercial uh, for a medical product 80 meg to 6 gig now medical products begin because of their liability they're tested typically to 30 volts per meter versus the 3 volts per meter for a commercial uh, device so by running this test um, there's a IEC 6101-2, I think, 
is the standard for medical products, and it's basically a subset of the IEC 61000-4-3. Again, it references the test methodology, what, how you step through the frequencies, how you do your chamber setup, all those details are in the standards. And it, it basically just says, you got a medical product, you got to test it to a higher standard. Do these, do, do these tests incorporate any kind of communication protocols, or are these just basically physical phenomena that you're causing? Um, most of the tests, you're just blasting it with a straight sine wave. Sometimes it's a modulated sine wave. So that, uh, it can have an FM carrier on it or an AM carrier on it. Sometimes people put digital um, carriers on it. But I think the standards mostly call for a sine wave with FM or, or AM modulation on it. Uh, you're supposed to be running your product through the, its active cycles. So you got to run your product in a real life situation. So let's say it's an infusion pump. You should be have it turned on and pumping stuff so you know if the pumps are going to be affected by RF. Yes, sir. I want to add to that, for the medical products, there is what they call proximity testing, which would simulate a cell phone or something in the area, and they do use a pulse and modulation to okay. simulate the cell phone steps. And automotive has the same distance. They've just come up, they, it's generically called the handy transmitter test, where you, you simulate several signals that's supposed to be like putting your cell phone on top of your entertainment center on the dashboard in your car. That entertainment center also happens to be GPS and a lot of other stuff. So make sure that doesn't get messed up. Yeah. And if you guys have more wireless over the air testing, I think our next presentation at 10 o'clock will cover more of the protocols and that sort of thing with BTS and the grid. Uh, do we have any more questions for Chuck? Uh, he's also going to be at his booth for the next, what, five, six hours across the parking lot. So let's give him a round of applause. <laughs>